And I'm here at Thomson Reuters to talk about document automation with a fabulous panel. Um, as you all know, document automation is not new, um, but it, uh, Catherine Bamford from Bam Legal, who many of you will know, um, informs me that in firms of more than, 50, less, more than 50 partners, less than a quarter have even attempted automating the drafting of their contracts. So the panel that we have today are much further ahead than many, and hopefully we'll have some really valuable tips in terms of their, their successes and their challenges and hopefully how they've overcome them. I'm going to start, we've got Damien Behan from Brody dialing in. If I can just allow you to introduce yourself, Damien, it's Damien, and then I'll, um, and then I'll um, introduce the rest of the panel. Sure. I'm Damien Behan. I'm the IT director at Brodie's, um, but I kind of get involved in lots of other stuff. But um, document automation is something fairly dear to my heart. So I was involved in implementing a very early version of this software um, back in about 15 years ago at Baker McKenzie. So I've kind of had a lot of experience of it over the years, and uh, we've been using it at Brodie's for just over a year now. Um, I'm Charlotte Ballard. I'm the Knowledge Operations Manager at Pennington's Manchester. Um, I'm responsible for looking at projects that help improve efficiency um, and saving money across the firm, as well as encouraging collaborative culture um, and consistency of approach um, as much as possible. Thank you. Hello, I'm Sarah Houghton. Um, I work at Hogan Nobles in the Knowledge Team, and I'm the Document Automation Manager. Hi, I'm Chris Bolt. I'm the Product Director for Contract Express here at Thomson Reuters. I think what I'm going to hopefully bring to the discussion is a broader overview perhaps of what we see from all our clients around Contract Express, um, an idea of the kind of breadth of use cases that we have for the product, and also just to call out that it is something we use internally ourselves on our practical law products. So we've got experience with a lot of the same work that um, the other speakers here have. Brilliant. Thank you, everybody. I think it would be really useful um, if, if everybody could talk. Everybody we, we have today is on a, a really different stage in their journey. Um, I think so. If we could start perhaps with Damien, I think. Uh, perhaps you are the newest um, to, 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 to come to document automation. If you could just describe where you are um, in, in, terms of, in terms of implementing document automation at Brodie's. Yep, sure. Well, we are, um, as I said, we're probably a year into it. Um, we, it's not the only automation we've done, uh, Contract Express, because we have a case management system that does kind of very rudimentary uh, production of documents that are straightforward, but um, <clears throat> what we have taken on Contract Express to do is really to advance some of the more complicated drafting, and um, uh, in particularly our corporate and real estate departments, and, and the um, I suppose the having had experience of this in the past and knowing what's involved in it, knowing the amount of work that goes into producing a good uh, draft. Um, uh, or automating a good draft of a document. My In the early stages of people getting very excited about this, I was really being very clean and clear with our partners to stress that this would require lawyer time from and, and other resources to, to build up the system to the point where it would be really useful for people. So um, <clears throat> that was kind of a lot of my involvement was sort of making the case for this, but also making uh, being clear about the not only the benefits, but also the the effort required and the resources required to achieve those. Um, <clears throat> so we initially, we had a few little false starts at the, at the beginning in terms of identifying, well, who was going to be doing the work, who's, who was going to be um, d creating the documents and automating them, coding them up, um, and, and identifying, just finding the right people to do that, because it's also not maybe a job that Everyone is suited to it. Some you kind of need to find the people who are who are suited to it and keen to do it, um, and, and that takes a little bit of time. But um, we also then spent a, a, quite a long time looking at which documents would we automate, where would we start, and we've. I suppose you can start big or you can start small, and we decided to do both. So we started big in corporate by deciding that the SPA was going to be the thing that gave us the most uh, bang for our buck, the share purchase agreement, <clears throat> but it's also one of the most complicated documents to start with. So we, we went into that with eyes open that it wasn't going to be a trivial thing to do. And then on our real estate department decided to take the opposite approach and to 
select a series of often used but um, fairly straightforward documents to automate. So we've kind of come at it from both angles and seen seen both both work, um, but obviously there's there's a lot more effort required to start with a really complicated uh, document. And I suppose the the building. Um, I don't know, Caroline, if you want me to kind of go through all of these discussion points at once. No, that's fine. Or, you, just, so you just launched your FPA, is, is that right? But it took, it took a year before. Yes, yeah, we just launched that recently. So so we're in the process now of really just going out and showing that to uh, the teams and, and uh, as it says on the screen there, building internal momentum, trying to tell people, well, this is the way things are going to happen now in the future. But I think for us, the one of the biggest issues was agreeing what that SPA was going to look like and, and getting people to actually decide that um, they weren't going to use their own very special, unique um, unicorn version, which only they um, only they could use because it was so so unique to them. And getting everyone to agree that actually we could we could come up with a version that everyone would be happy with. And I think that's in terms one of lessons version of the learned. Truth. One version of the truth is exactly yeah. it. And you brought in, um, and you brought in before, just before I move on to Charlotte, you you, you brought in, I think, a, a PSL. Is that right? So in terms, of, so the resourcing has been really key. Yes. So I think uh, the corporate department, uh, corporate commercial department, identified after a little while that really um, our PSL there was already maxed out time-wise, and that this required resource, um, and we we therefore hired someone to as a PSL to do. The work of um, pulling together all of that, those those documents, and and she's kind of now the the real expert on Contract Express. But then we have Secretary of Resource actually doing a lot of the coding, but she's sort of leading the whole thing. So that's again been quite useful and quite interesting. But um, <clears throat> the resource requirement is is can be significant if you if you particularly try and um, do a, a very large complex document with lots of ancillary documents. I, there was, I have to tell you, there was a silent cheer here in the room when you mentioned the SPA has just launched. <laughs> 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 uh, yeah. Charlotte, Charlotte, you have your own experience with that, but tell us, you've, you've used, you've used doc document automation for years, but tell us, so when, yeah. when did it start and tell us your so, journey? Um, I joined Pennington's Lunches in 2015, but they first started looking at it in 2014 with two of my previous colleagues who are very experienced in it um, and having used it at a previous firm as well. So they understood what the uh, software could do. So they started looking in 2014 um, and then they launched their first automated document in 2015 um, and then and that started with about 50 licenses and they started in the real estate department. And we were very lucky that we had um, a knowledge lawyer, which is what we call PSL, uh, PM, um, that was very capable and excited about the process and was very keen to see how powerful a tool it could be to be speeding up our transactions um, and to be making the best use of time and expertise of what we had within the firm. So they started with the real estate, um, a suite of leases, um, and then gradually they started to roll those out and we are, I guess, four years into our journey. Uh, we started with 50 licenses. Um, we've now, over that course of time, hired two specific people to do document automation. So I was involved initially in the um, engagement piece and looking at projects and project managing some of them. And then we brought in a specific automation specialist. And then in the last year, we've recruited another person to help do that. And then. Um, one of our colleagues has recently been promoted to the document automation manager to really drive this stream home as we're getting more and more take on it. So I'd say over the last four years we've got seven um, you know, successfully automated projects. And I say projects as opposed to specific documents because within the projects there are suites of documents and it's also for us not just about the document being automated and being contracts. For us we're using it as a tool to drive conversations and greater collaboration, which is one of our main focuses. Um, and now we have 185 licenses um, that have been assigned to the firm, and not just the owners. So you, and you, you automate NDA engagement? Yes, so we've automated right? um, our NDA. Uh, we have a 
probate suite currently being looked at. The SPA is um, tantalizingly close to being uh, tested. Um, uh, we've automated mortgage suite documents, employment contracts, um, testing stage for our debt recovery documents, court documents, um, and we've also um, created good relationships with firms like Laserform to see where we can connect up with them. Did you do the SPA in one, attempted in one or two? Yes, we drafted our SPA from scratch, um, which was a challenge in itself. Having a large corporate team that sits over several offices, um, our knowledge lawyer had a very challenging time to get consensus, but you know she did it and it was it's very well received and being used. And then the markup for that is is beautiful. Um, as to how to automate it, it's an absolute work of art, and, and actually set a lot of best practice in place as to the best way to mark up a document. So we're now looking at ancillary documents, and in hindsight, maybe we could have gone live without doing you know the warranties or, or some of the aspects of it. But we have decided that for the culture of our firm and, and what we think would be best is to is to go out with it automated um, in a you know closer to 80, 90 percent. Mm -hmm. um, then you could approach it. Okay. And so you joined whilst automation was already underway at the time, but you've given it a new lease of life. Yeah, so right? I joined 18 months ago, and mm -hmm. we, the firm already had products that had been used um, nearly as, as so far. Um, so we started by targeting a specific practice area in London that had a big. Um, a large amount of model documents, so we knew the content was already there. Um, once we'd sort of built up a library for that practice group, then we then started speaking to other practice groups and in other jurisdictions. So we're now offering automation globally um, throughout the firm. We've also spent quite a lot of time building up the governance behind automation, so those processes of how we get documents automated and how we have a consistent approach globally um, and how we also report on the automation. It's important that we can report and measure our successes um, and report back to groups. And in the sort of last 18 months, we've built up a dedicated automation team. So we have three um, document automation specialists and we work closely with the subject matter experts to get the documents automated and build up relationships with them. Yeah, I think we'll come back to the ROI reporting because I think that's really interesting. Um, and we might as well touch on SPA. Do you have an SPA story to share? We do have an SPA story. Um, that was actually started before I joined the firm, and we yeah. have done it in phases. Yeah. Um, I think especially in a large firm, to get consensus and an agreement on the content, we found it's much easier to do it in stages. So we're on stage two now, so it's up and running and people are using it, and then we want to go back. And we've also found by doing that, we can get feedback from the lawyers that are using it on what the new questions should be or what ancillary documents should be suited. Yeah. And you spent, I think we'll come back to this, but you spent a lot of time marketing it effectively, haven't you? Yes. So um, we've marketed with um, posters, using newsletters, bulletins, um, using our intranet. Just to get, but yeah, the more people are talking about it, the more they know it. You, you kind of forget when you're at your desk and you're doing it every day yeah. that everyone throughout the firm isn't thinking about automation and you need to spread the word because otherwise they're not going to know. So is that what you need to, so in order to get the project off the ground, is, is, what, what would you say is essential and what, 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 what perhaps with hindsight would you have done differently? Um, I think we did do this, but I think one thing that was essential was um, getting the key stakeholders on board from the beginning. So we spoke to partners, senior management, our knowledge lawyers, met with them, gave them a demo with the product and made sure they really knew what the product was and what we were trying to achieve. So our aim is to get our lawyers a good first draft and we always say we're trying to take out all the repetitive elements, the elements that a lawyer shouldn't be spending time doing. We're not trying to replace them. Um, and making sure they, they understand that so they know what they're getting at the end result. Um, and also if you've got those stakeholders um, on board to begin with, it becomes a priority project throughout the firm, and this it is time consuming for our lawyers to work with us, so it needs to be seen as a key business priority for them to come on board. Damien, do you agree? Obviously, resources is, is, is key for you. What, what needs to be in place for, your, for an automation project to get off the ground, would you say? Well, I think, um, as, uh, as Sarah just said, the kind of getting the buy in from the outset is really important. and for me that was basically getting the heads of the department to say yes I agree this is going to take some resource but yes I agree this is worth doing because at various stages when things seem to be 
lagging or there's, you know, can't free people up to do the work or whatever it may be, you can refer back to them and say, well, you promised you'd, you'd take this seriously, you know, and, and they, they will then free up resource and do things for you. So it's it's sort of a almost a protective thing to start from the position of everyone being clear that this is something we need to not just invest money in, but lots of time in, and then and then keep coming back to that and saying, well, you know, if you really want this to work, as you said you did, we need that resource. But I think um, there's that, and I think actually exactly what Sarah said there, you need to bring people along on the journey and make sure they're involved all, all the way. Um, and the, the, one of the key things, I think, as well, is just not trying to boil the ocean, you know, trying to really um, focus it. Uh, uh, there's that sort of saying of the perfect being the enemy of the good, and I think that's that's a real, really applicable here is that you can waste a lot of time trying to make the perfect automated document, but um, it really what you're trying to do is make a good first draft, and um, you know the, the AC20 rule comes into play here where um, you want to launch something that's good enough that people trust it and see that it's valuable but you want to get it out quick enough that you're not wasting a huge amount of time trying to keep everyone happy and make it as perfect as it can be. So um, I think that that's a real lesson um, that is best learned pretty early on, that you need to be realistic about what can be achieved and then um, make sure that you're focusing your efforts to get a good uh, first version, which you can then iterate as you go through. So um, that, that, I think, is a key thing. This is such a it's a theme that runs through all adoption of new tech, doesn't it? That culture, the culture of perfection, which is the enemy of yes. innovation. So Chris, you've yeah, got more questions on and, and people have spoken a bit about where they are in the adoption and automation mm. journey. I think the bit that I haven't heard many of the panel and we do we are where our other customers are doing is once they've got to a certain level of kind of having document automation embedded in their practice areas is to start to use that technology in other ways. And this is why I was talking about different use cases uh, earlier. In the, there we, we see um, it being taken to use as a customer-facing tool, and that's where that first draft bit becomes slightly different because you're actually providing final documents to customers. And also involved in kind of different, more automated workflows around volume transactions and things like that. So be there a repapering exercise or something like that, and the role that something like Contract Express can play in that. So I guess what I'm kind of raising is that there's a journey around, let's get document automation within these practice areas, let's get it used as a drafting tool as it's been for many, many years, Contract Express has been using that, but what we see more and more from our customers is, okay, now what else can it do? We've got the technology moment, out and exploit it. You know, so what would you say, what are people, I mean, it's not supposed to be resource intensive, really, is it? That's, yeah. that's a, so what are people doing that, that they, or what, what should they be doing that they're not doing in terms of getting these projects off the ground? Do you, you, you must see, you've got experience, you've seen experiences from across a lot yeah. of different law firms. Is there something that, is there a key to success do you think in terms of what they need to have in place in order to get things going, moving? Before we start looking at, I mean, I agree, client facing, no, no, I white labelling is, is where I see it going. But you know, you need to get it established in order for that to happen, don't you? Genuinely, I, I think it's probably the biggest challenge that we see is people who have underestimated the, what the job actually is, yeah. and it's the point that. It's, and there is a degree of, and quite a large degree of marking up documents and, and, and putting in, if a contract express, putting in our contract express markup language. But it's it's kind of, we, we meet prospectus customers and it's the funda fundamental understanding that it's not just marking something up, it's distilling the knowledge of your law firm down into that document. And that's a process that's not just a, a kind of technology process, it's, it's a bit of a knowledge management process. I think that's the bit that, I wouldn't say that we see firms that don't get it, but I think it's probably the biggest consideration is that actually you need the time of a certain type of legal expert to distill your own knowledge into that single piece of, doc, uh, piece of document. And, and it can be done with external automators, and, and we have some of those who, who, who help, but there, there's always a need to have that legal knowledge in kind of saying, right, we understand we've got X number of different precedents, we need to take that down into 
a single piece. It, 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 well, it, it also, there's a question of, I guess, what's the word, at what level in the hierarchy you might want to stop yet. And if I look at our own practical law yeah. documents, we've, we have um, automated NDAs, and I think we've got two or three of them, yeah, and one's for a single and one's for kind of mutual. And we can, and I now doubt we will in the future, create one so that forks higher up that hierarchy. Mm -hmm. But for expediency, decisions were taken to say, let's just keep it as two at the moment. So there, there's different ways to kind of, uh, I guess, get to that point. And where can you deliver the most value quickest is probably one of the questions to ask. And it's in software development, we have a kind of concept of a minimal viral, minimal viral product. I mean, it's how quickly you can get something to market that provides value to the customer. And there are ways and means to look at your document automation process a little bit like that. Okay. Um, just talking briefly about objectives. So, clear, you know, objectives is clear. I imagine it's very clear, uh, key to set objectives and then keep those in sight at all times. Damien, did you, what, what, objectives, what objectives did you set um, for your project? Well, I mean, the, the corporate and commercial guys, it was, a, it was a very clear one, which was we are spending loads of time messing around with SPAs and they, they take loads of effort and time and what have you. We need a way of making that simpler, easier, and also more more rigorous, um, you know, have more integrity in the, in the document that's produced. So um, there's a, a sort of risk element as well that make, let's make sure that we're consistently doing the, these documents in the right way. Um, but I think from the the, the, the rationale really with what what it's very good at is um, where you've got multiple documents that you want to insert a set of data into. Um, so having a suite of documents, which is what, where the SPA comes in. Um, so that that's kind of a, a key, that was a key objective for us was to make something that's very time consuming and um, inconsistently done across the department into something that we, we all agree on and it's simplified and standardized. Um, so that was a kind of key objective. I, I would say as well, there's, there's probably an element of competitive threat as well that we felt was, um, which I think I'm seeing more and more on a general level in terms of technology and the approach to technology in, in, legal, in the legal sector and certainly in our firm is a sense of from the partners of saying, well, if we don't do this, other people will and we'll be left behind. So I think it's probably a technology and a an approach that's time has come really where the you know, all the talk of innovation and um robot lawyers and everything else is really focusing the minds of people and saying, Well actually yeah, if if the machine can do this consistently and, you know, save us time then clients aren't going to want us to to continue to do things in the old way. So I think an objective was sort of to, to really modernize the way we're working was probably a very high level one. Was let's not let's not wait till it's too late. Let's actually start doing this now and get on the front foot with it. Yeah. To me I mean to me it's a no brainer and uh, as clients are more increasingly demanding efficiency and, and law firms are looking at ways to protect their margins, I think it's just you know, it's, it's but it's just interesting that it's such you know it's taking this much time. It's interesting as an outsider, and I appreciate there are reasons for that. <laughs> and I think you're right that we've reached a certain stage now where um, firms are really taking it seriously. Um, so, so Sarah, I mean, so building momentum, you, you touched on this briefly, but I think it's worth revisiting um, about how you build in, in momentum and buy-in, which is a key thing. And I, think I was quite impressed with um, some, of the, some of the efforts that you went to. So could tell us a bit more about, about the marketing you did. Yeah, so we... Um Initially, as I said, we made sure we met with our knowledge lawyers, our partners, senior management, and we'd make sure they'd, we'd explain what we were doing and give them a demo of the system. And then we spent quite a long time thinking how we could make sure that just everybody knew what um, the document automation was and what we were doing. So we looked at... Um, we put documents or our acute question and answer articles on our um, intranet. Uh, we've had articles in newsletters. We put, had a poster campaign, so we had a um, document automation poster throughout on all the kitchens um, globally throughout the office, just explaining very briefly what it is, 
um, and how people can get involved and learn more. We've created a product image, um, so we chose one and that's branded. So we've kind of branded the product um, and given it a brand name so people are aware and they can remember it. Um, and all of that is to raise awareness, make sure people are aware of what we're doing, and just to know who to get in touch with to find out more. Um, Chris, is there, do you think there, is there more, um, you mentioned the client-facing automation, I think, and, and that to me is where eventually further down the line the real value is coming. Um, is there pressure now, do you see pressure on law firms from the client to, to use automation? And I don't necessarily mean client-facing automation, I just mean to, to start automating their documents. Are we seeing in-house pressure from the in-house sector to do this? Um, in my experience and understanding, yes. And I think from the, the couple of examples, one, from a, I don't know if any of you guys go to the clock conference or anything like that, but I, 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 I've, I've sat in that clock conference and, and heard the, the kind of the legal operations guys talk about their best practice. And one of the things is you need to check with your panel firms and question them and make sure that they're using technologies and automation. So there's a, there's a, I don't know how that pushes back into the law firms, but from my experience, that's what the, that's what the legal ops departments are kind of. Uh, 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 are looking for, and the other area I, I, I see it, and it's and it's to the competition point that I think Damien raised, is, is that we see some of our customers kind of pulling out of, well not pulling out, but creating something that's almost competitive to their current business, saying here is a tech-led service line, and it's separate to the rest of the law firm, and it's underpinned by document automation, and they're going to approach it that way, and, and almost kind of do that thing of setting up something that might potentially compete with themselves, because they're providing a cheaper kind of maybe, I don't know, less, I wouldn't say less valuable, but less kind of detailed and comprehensive service, service driven by technology at a cheap price and to get that out in the market. And we, we see it all being used like that as well. Uh, Caroline, yeah, sorry, sorry, Dam Damien yeah. here. Um, I mean, I, I, I have a fairly <coughs> recent live example, which is actually just came in last week, which was a partner phoning me up and saying, we probably can't do this. You can tell me it's sort of rubbish and I'll tell them we can't do it. But you know, clients come along and said, they don't really want to pay us to do these very simple loan agreements that they they do umpteen times, and you know they don't they just basically want to make us redundant is is the word to use that you know they don't want to pay for us to do this stuff. I don't suppose there's anything we can do, and I was like, well, actually there is, um, but that that's an example I think of a client going in this day and age, why am I paying expensive lawyers to do very simple drafting? And of course the answer is probably because I want to be covered by their PI insurance or something like that, or I want to have some sort of um, you know, risk, uh, risk management in place and, and getting a established law firm to do it is a, is a, a hedge against that kind of risk. Um, yeah. But if we can provide a, a, a system that, is, that we're happy with from a risk perspective, um, you then that, that's, that seems like a simple tick box exercise, but then of course, the next discussion you have is, well, so how do we make money out of this? You know, if it's going to cost us to use this service that we're paying Thomson Reuters for. Um, we you know, have licensing to cover the time, there's everything else. You know, it's not it's not free. We're not we're not uh, getting it from a charity here. So so that's fine. But we're not a charity either. So, but I think the the conversation then is, well, would we rather lose that client? because we can't do this, or would we rather give them a either a free or a loss-leading kind of service that we then can we can build on by saying, well, actually, okay, you can draft them, but if you want, we'll look, at, we'll look them over for you, um, and we'll charge you X for that, and we'll charge you a base price for that. So you get into more of a, a service-led sort of um, pricing consideration of, well, okay, what does this model look like, and it's a different way of offering a legal service that isn't just time on the clock for you know doing something or a fixed fee per document or however you, you used to do it. So yeah. um, I think that's the challenging thing for law firms is that the world's changing and the old ways of doing things maybe not holding anymore and then it's, it's sort of having to think in a very different way about the service you're providing and 
designing new products effectively, which which isn't something they're necessarily used to. I think you're right. I think it will get to the stage where if you don't do it, someone else will, um, and that their client will have that choice. And but also, I think it's interesting that you're going in. in whereas previously, you might have to farm out a portion of the work to a different an LPO or whatever. Actually, you're seeing firms now being able to keep work in house and 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 make it offer it as part of a, a holistic. Oh, you know, client offering, which I think presents actually opportunities. Do you, um, Sarah? Do you um, have you got a client-facing portion yet to your no, offering? No, uh, so um, we found that we wanted to sort of get automation up and running internally, make sure we were all confident with it, that the um, automation team were confident automating before we start thinking about offering it to clients. And we're now at the point where we think we can start on that journey. Okay. Um, not currently, but it's on our roadmap very clearly. Um, one of the projects that I mentioned earlier, we're hoping that there will be client interaction to have a good um, conversation with them where they are completing information um, on our behalf um, in order to speed things up um, in, in the end-to-end -end process. Yeah. Um, so we're gathering information from them, and then as that's brought in, it's, there's less of that re-entry of information, yeah. um, and that it just it makes things a lot more smoother. Yeah. And, and yeah. Damien here again, Caroline. Sorry to interrupt, but uh, okay. you know, you, you, doing doing it internally is almost the Trojan horse. The way that you you get the partners comfortable with the whole theory and idea of using this sort of software, <clears throat> and also understanding what goes into it. And then you can move on to the client stuff. I think it, it's probably mm -hmm. it's too scary to start from the let's yeah. give clients contracts that they can yeah. fill out themselves. Oh. Yeah, that that's a way to scare partners, right. isn't it? But um, if you if you say, well, you know that thing we do internally, we could give that to clients and charge mm -hmm. them a fixed fee, and you know make money for doing very little. You know that that's kind of an easier easier sell. Although I think it's still then a challenge from what I hear in terms of. Obviously, you move then to a, effectively a digital business, which is subscription-based potentially, which is what, what we're seeing. You know, some of the firms like Clever Chance, you know, and then you have to get partners comfortable. I mean, this is a, a leap down the line, but then you have to get partners comfortable with selling software. And then we're seeing some really interesting developments in terms of creating separate ventures, which obviously you know did a long time ago, and Clever Chance did quite recently. Um, so change management, I mean, I, I think this all comes down to, I think change management is, must be, is a huge element of, of getting partners comfortable, as Damien, you were just talking about, and making progress. So, Damien, perhaps start with you. How important is experience of change management? Um, I think it is, it is quite important. It is, um, as I said, we, we've, you know, some of the, the types of things that... Um, that were talked about earlier. I think was Charlotte was talking about some, you know, employment debt recovery, um, probate. That we we use a case management system to produce a lot of those documents. But um, that, and that's been traditionally an IT thing because we have a developer or two developers that do that job of producing these this case management system and workflows and document generation and everything else. Whereas Contract Express is not an IT product. Product really, I would say it's a it's a bit of software that, lawyer, that lawyers and um, other support staff use to automate the documents they use every day. My team has next to nothing to do with it, so it's it's quite a different proposition. So, and from a change management perspective, my team are probably a bit more used to change management than other areas of the firm. But I think the, what, the way Sarah was talking there was was really it's essential to just sort of almost saturate people with. The, the message that you're trying to get out, which might be, you know, you need to use this to to be more efficient or to, you know, save yourself the drudge work, which is probably a better message. But, you know, there's that whole thing that you have to tell people the same message eight times or whatever it is before they actually listen. And if you send out a single memo saying, we've got this new thing, you should use it, that just gets lost in, in the, um, the email uh, overload that everyone's... Um, deluged with every day so you need to consistently be messaging things in order for change to happen and you need to ju not just launch but then follow up and keep following up and stand beside them while they use it you know how's that going <clears throat> why did you not use it there and you know or have you done any of this type of documents in the last couple of weeks oh yeah i did actually did you use it no i didn't really so it's it's sort of 
there's a multi-faceted, multi-pronged approach to change management, which is sort of saturating them in terms of communication, but also then being there to guide and help and answer questions and not just leaving people to their own devices, I think. No, I would say, um, even though it's really important to relay the message and, and saturate them, Damon, I can agree more that they need to know what it is that's happening and that this tool is available to them, because obviously part of knowledge management is our job to let everyone know what tools are available internally in order to make them work more efficiently. But at the same time, you have to manage the expectations as well, yeah. and I think that's really important that even if you say to them, this is available, this is available, you have to also say, this is our current working list and have that transparency that says, I will help you, I will fit you in, this is our process, this is our best practice. Once you have your model document in place, then come to us and we can start along this process. And we manage a lot of ours, um, as I said, I've called them projects, and we literally create a, a project initiation document. We then look at what the benefits are, what the risks are, what the issues are, and, and document it so that there is a clear return on investment at the end as well. And did we? And it's also that scope creep as well, because you'll produce something, and it won't be exactly what they want. It never, it never it never will be at, at first try, but by having that scope and that continuous conversation with them about what it is you're trying to achieve, that will ensure that you get a, a greater success rate first time out. So it's, I would say managing the expectations, making sure people are aware of it, and just trying to embed it. Um, there are some things that I wish I'd done initially when we were um, trying to embed it, which was A, it sounds really simple, but create an internet page. That sounds really, really simple and, and foolhardy that we that we didn't, but we now have one, so we have somewhere to, to point people to. Um, but it also has some great quotes from people that have used it. Um, so it's um, it's factual, and people can understand, and they go, oh, they're using it. I wouldn't have thought that. Um, but it's also really important to have the evidence that this is, this is where we want people to go. We use our knowledge champions. We have them with every single team, not just practice areas but within our central teams and Who are the so associates or? they are a mixture so they'll be um, partners associates they could be um, uh, BD managers they'll be IT um, project managers or um, on the service desk um, they can be anyone they, they'll also be from within our risk team as well and when we get together or when I blast them with comms quite a bit saying don't forget this or please can you make sure um, we're also embedding it within their thought process to go back to their teams. They're, they are our channels into the teams to have communication and to make sure that they raise things at their team meetings. There's seven offices, I can't get to all of them. Um, and also people need to hear it from, from different people. And they, those are the subject matter experts where they know the use case scenario. So you can get them involved earlier, like the yeah. process, rather than presenting yeah. them something at the end and saying, yeah. that's, that's, that's actually exactly. not like what you like. You can get them involved a bit earlier yeah. on. In and it's right. part of the change management to know that they've been brought along as part of the journey of what they're doing. The idea for us is to make sure people feel involved. And, and obviously, they need to understand the what's in it for me. They need to understand why we're there to help them, and it's not there to correct them or critique how they currently work. It's to improve and to help them work more efficiently or to um, take away the, the sort of everyday pains that they might have. Um, and if we can do that via this, then, then that's great. Um, it's also, when we go on these journeys of starting the projects, sometimes you'll go in thinking, right, what I need to do is automate this. And actually, it could be... Um, something to do with the process, or actually it's another person needs to be doing this, and actually if we look at the whole process of, you know, and, and map the process of what it is you're trying to achieve, we could take out that step, and actually if you just spoke to them, then that would actually work. So it's that whole process mapping, driving efficiency, and this is a tool that helps us do that and starts the conversation. Um, we found... Communicating back definitely helps with change management piece. Um, so we reg we take monthly reports of usage and time savings from document automation. Um, we use those, we report back to um, practice group leaders, especially when they've been successful and say, you've now automated this many documents, we've saved this much time. Um, and on the reverse, where we've automated a document that isn't being used, we can go back and say, it's not getting the usage, you know, do we need to improve it or should we go back to the practice group and give them another demo? Can we talk to people and find out what's, um, you know, why they may not be using it? But sharing that information, um, the successes 
and things that haven't been so successful so we can have lessons learned we found really useful um, yeah we've had if we've automated a document that isn't being used and then the partners are, sometimes it's just the case that they're not, they're not doing that piece of work at this current mm -hmm. time other times people might look back and say maybe we picked the wrong document and we can learn from those lessons but similarly where we've had great successes we can share them with other groups and other regions and say you know look what they're doing in this fractured group in london mm -hmm. we could do the same for you here so i think that really helps you've got factual information to show people and do comparisons in and um, I think that really helps with the change management. Should we make it a bit competitive? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> showing which team is doing well and which um, one isn't. I think it helps if you go and say, if you've got a practice group that's doing particularly well and you can say, this is what we've achieved here. And I don't think you have to say you could do it. It's sort of there for them to, to make it competitive if they want to be. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm just wondering as a, a general question. What, we've, what you've all talked about are um, really kind of, kind of, carrots in terms of in incentivizing people to use things and in the corporate market kind of the opposite is to do it's kind of stick because you when they roll out kind of sales contract stuff they remove the ability to create these in any other way and i'm just thinking in terms of the world of your internal users is there a, bit of a process where you will gradually remove if you have those knowledge management knowledge management systems alternative approaches. So I've, I've seen law firms where they've indicated to me, here's our practice, here's a knowledge management system, here are our practice areas. If you drill down this path in this practice area, you'll get to kind of flat precedence. But if you go this other way, all you will see is a, is a contract express kind of questionnaire. And actually you kind of, it's not enforcement, it's more kind of very strong encouragement to, to limit people's ability to work in the way they've done before. And I wonder if you do any of that. We, we tried, I really <laughs> like to do that and say that there's no more sort of model, old model document. Um, but we've taken a flexible approach because yeah. some partner practice groups have been very reluctant. They want that part of the original copy for review purposes or just for their own uh, peace of mind. So we've taken that flexible approach where we definitely try wherever we can to direct people to the automated version and that's the easiest one to find. Um, but we have where they've wanted allowed that existing um, copy and our hope is that using the automated version is so much better that you know, if we're doing our job right, they should never want to go and use the old copy. Mm -hmm. no, we have, yeah, sorry, so we have, um, one of our knowledge shows had, did make the gutsy decision that this is um, this is on here. This is this is what you're using. She's amazing, and she has great buy-in within the within the division. So um, she did say this is what you use, and that has been taken away. And she manages the shouts if there are any, um, but more often than not, that proves successful. It doesn't always work, and there are lots of problems that go beforehand to say from this date. FYI, I mean, you can't stop people anyway from beforehand. They have something if they ha locally, yeah. They'll save it if they want to, or they'll pull out an alternate. It's, 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 it's a culture. culture. I'm going to come on to talk about culture, but it's, so for example, contract review and then the name transaction. So here we've got one team that that's now, the, they, they clearly said that that is the default position unless you have an excuse not to use it in, in, in certain transactions. Mm -hmm. And I think actually there has, there has to be a communication from on high to say, right, this is what happens. I appreciate it's a different thing. So um, culturally, um, what cultural challenges? Um, I mean, we, I'm sure there are plenty. <laughs> <laughs> and we've probably touched on some of them. But maybe Damien, we'll bring Damien in. So cu cultural challenges, Damien, what, what, what cultural challenges did you face and how did you overcome them? Before we come yeah. up to some questions in a minute. I think I think it's something I mentioned earlier, but it's that idea that um, everyone has their own favourite version of something that they think is is unique, that um, and they they just like it. It's, it's habits. It's, it's breaking habits, I suppose, and people saying, "Well, I've always done it in this form, and this is the one I like, and I've you know been through four firms, and I've always used this one, or whatever it is." So there's there's a sort of habit. Um, breaking that needs to happen to, to say to them, well, no, this is the way we are all going to do this going forward. That's, I think, a, quite a cultural challenge, particularly when you're dealing with um, busy partners who are, who've kind of always done things in a particular way. So the, there's a sales job there required in terms of <clears throat> getting to see the, the benefit of moving to something new. Um, I think there's also just a, a busyness problem as well where 
people are it's, it's something I come across constantly is people who are too busy to become more efficient where um you know they're, they're sort of working really hard um and don't have time to stop to improve how well they're working so so that I think is quite quite tricky is is there's an inertia there with uh, people without with anyone and I'm not saying this is just lawyers but for any of us you get used to a way of working change is hard and it's it's difficult and it's annoying and it's frustrating and then once you've done it it's it's fine and you move on but it's that nobody likes that period of feeling like you're you're slower than you would normally be or you're um having to change the way you work so I think that's the biggest issue culturally is just getting people to accept that uh, change is happening to them but as uh, I think Sarah said you know you need to involve them in the change so it's not being done to them they're being um, brought along for the journey and, and they're part of it. And manage expectations, is that fair enough? So you, yeah. about 18 months ago you had a big push on, this is directed to Charlotte, so you had yeah. a big push on managing their expectations. Yeah, making sure that they they knew what they were going to be getting from it and making sure that what we set out at the start to achieve is is what we we try to deliver to them. Um, so it's that it's a continuous conversation. It's hard though because um, our subject matter experts are not always able to be the knowledge lawyer. We have um, knowledge lawyers in in some of our teams, but not in all of them. We have 18 different practice areas. Um, it's not always possible. So you are reliant upon lawyers or fee earners within there to give you their time and expertise um, because we can't make some of those decisions. You always have to have this. So it's really important within there to look at, A, who has an appetite for it, um, you know, B, someone that's used it in the past. So I now, and I wish I'd started doing it sooner, but about, about what's it about, just over a year ago, I started talking about it at induction. So I get a half hour slot um, when we have new joiners and I talk to them about knowledge in general um, and information in and out. And then I also touch on Contract Express and what we can do. And then I see a show of hands of who's used it before, heard of it, explain it. And then I go and follow that up and say, wow, okay, what have you used it on before? This is what we currently have available. If you want a demo, get in touch and we'll, we'll sort it out. Um, so it's that continuous change to say this is what we have. Um, you know, we have a very supportive management board that understands the value that it brings because we give them um, every few months uh, return on investment statistics of what we're doing. Um, so it's it's really important. We've also, I've tried within my team to put um, objectives in place as well as to help the to change culture um, and also look at those that, with the owners that have an interest in technology or wanting to um, aspire um, and develop um, that they can get involved so that they will give us their time. It's that what's in it for them. The yeah, objectives um, within my team as well is, is very key. I think we might at least, I've got another, one more question. I think we might have time for, if, if anyone listening in wants to send in a question, we might have a couple of minutes at the end if you'd like to do that. But um, I just wanted to ask everybody um, what you would, and this probably is a million dollar mm -hmm. question, um, what you would recommend to others looking to embark on the same journey? Perhaps if we could start with Sarah. Um, I think as we've already said, I think getting both stakeholders involved from the onset is key. Um, in my experience, I think starting small, have a targeted group, and I've been starting with the simpler documents first, um, so you don't get caught in a big project that's never going live and it feels like you've been talking about it for so long and people you know lose interest whereas if that, and I think as people have touched on time is a real constraint getting lawyer time getting the subject matter experts involved you know we've sh whenever I've shown um, document automation to people they're always really keen they get the benefits straight away but their big concern is their capacity to work with you so if you can start with a smaller manageable project where the markup isn't going to take them that long and the testing isn't going to take them that long and they've got something live fairly quickly then you're building that momentum and you then they feel more confident to move on to something more complex and they can see initially that they've gained something so yeah I think that'd be one of my key takeaways to start then, you know from Obviously, you want to move up the complexity, but you want these to be routine, yeah. commonly used, yeah. you know, regular. You know, and I know that, that, that 
they may, they may be complex as well, but presumably yeah. you know, this is the easy topic, exactly. this is the easy bit to start with. Yeah, and I think some people think let's start with something that we can, so it's really a big bang and everyone yeah. well, well, but actually yeah, if you can start with those smaller ones and you can build up quite quickly, if you're doing quite a sort of simple but routine and um, highly used documents, you can build up quite quickly. Um, I think the subject matter experts, they as they get more confident, they make things live quicker because you always have that lag where mm -hmm. they're waiting and they want to test and test and test and test. Mm -hmm. But once they've done that for, you know, a couple of times, they get more confident. So yes, yeah. let's, let's put it up and live. Yeah. Do you agree, Charlotte? Yeah, I would. I think if you're doing fee-earning documents, because I think actually you can get a lot of quick wins from other teams that aren't um, fee-earning. So like our central teams, we have documents um, being automated within there, and that's proved very successful. Um, but having an agreed precedent um, an agreed model document is the absolute for me. Um, if you start working with something and then as more people get involved and they go, oh, actually, I don't agree with that wording or I think we need to take a view on this, and once you've started already coding it, then that's when you start falling down the rabbit hole. So having that agreed document, there's a lot of prep work before you actually start saying, right, let's, let's start putting this into the system and coding it. There's, you know, having the agreement within the team and saying, this is our document, this is what, what our viewpoint is, who's going to be allocating time to look into this, and how how does that work? When are they going to do this, and what are the time frames? As I said, I, we look at it now as a project um, and try and look at all those different risks. But yeah, those documents, um, having that agreed is, is that absolute must. Okay, Damien? Um, no, nothing really to add to that one. I think I think everything you're saying there is is absolutely right. We did we did start with the the really really hard one, um, and got, you know uh, <laughs> I have to admit I I recommended against that that way of doing things, but we got there. But um, you know I think I think if we if you start small and build, you you're gonna uh, see the wins much quicker. And and as as uh, you said there, to build confidence in it. Okay. Um, we've got a couple of questions, so thank you for sending those in. Um, the first one. <laughs> um, <laughs> so the question: They need to do it, or someone else will. Is a good thing to say, but is it true? How or who do you think would fill this space if law firms were to act in their traditional archaic manner? New tech companies or other consultants, such as the big four, or do you think that more progressive law firms will drive those who fall behind? Anybody? Um, the, the example I'd call out, and it's probably used quite a lot, and it's a US example, is the, the LA law firm, I think it's LA, Silicon Valley law firm, Atrium. Um, and they get a lot of publicity, and they are pretty much a startup law firm where all their services are driven by kind of tech enablement. And I think so there's one model there of where competition might come from. And I think the big four is a really good example as well. I mean, we, we, we know that they're actually building capabilities in these areas. I've just realized that's obviously something that I said. <laughs> and we see, so this is just reading out like <laughs> Oh, yeah, it's me. Um, so... Um, uh, we see this happen. So, Cliff, to, to name two of the true funds, so Clifford Chance and Alan Novi, a and has been doing this for a long time. They've been providing subscription these digital services to clients, and Clifford Chance has just launched a, a separate venture called Applied Solutions. We're seeing, it's not just the big four, I think, that have, that have clocked onto this automated, repeatable um, task. It's it, it, law firms, and it's, it is t typically at the moment, the, the, as far as I see, the magic circles that are leading the way, um, and I think that that will just... That, that will just continue because what you'll find is that clients will be able to go to them um, and, and instead of having to go to a lawyer for the same advice, they'll just be able to pay a, a, an, an annual or monthly subscription and they'll be able to download that information. And I think that, that and, then, and then they will start to compete with each other. Those firms will, and, and Hogan Numbers and, and other firms will start to com compete because obviously you won't want to miss out on that on that work, and and, and then it's just you know it's the nature of competition is that it will ha it will spread or else you'll lose they'll lose business. And same in here, I, I think um, I think the, the the thing the thing that's maybe I, I absolutely agree, but I think that's maybe missing there from what we're all saying is that it's not necessarily that we all want to be doing the really routine work that pays low margins or anything. It's more that. If we don't do that work, we might miss out in the bigger work. So, you know, if we if we can very sort of reasonably and cheaply and for 
um, you know, for a low margin, we can provide a simple service to clients that means that they like us and they will then come to us when they have something more complicated for our legal brains to, to, to work with, then why wouldn't we do that? Because there's always a danger that if they go to a sort of a firm that's all about automation and doing things quickly and everything else, as that, those firms, and including the big four, as they get better at doing the low-level stuff, they'll start to look at doing the higher level stuff and then that becomes more of a, a competitive threat so it's not necessarily that the the kind of easily automatable documents are the ones that we really want to keep doing because they they're profitable or anything else it's more that they are the gateway to the bigger jobs that we do want from from those kind of companies and we don't want them going off and shopping around with other other companies who may tempt them away for other work as well giving um, clients the Amazon experience, isn't it? But they can just, you know, and that's the overly used. Uh, but it, but it's why would you when you if you if a firm is offering you Amazon, why on earth would you <laughs> as bad as it is for the rest of the retail sector? Why would you go elsewhere? So thank you so much for that. Um, and then so the next question is, how do you measure your time saving specifically in relation to a contract express document? I guess that might be a, a you Sarah um, question. Yes. Yeah, so we. But when we automate a document and it goes live, we ask the subject matter expert for an estimate of the time saving using the automated version compared to traditional drafting. And we say it's an estimate because if we tried to be too accurate, we'd never get it. They're not going to spend time timing. So they, and we ask for six minute blocks. Um, time, and that can range from what some of our smaller simple documents, they might say 18 minutes, we've got big suites where they might go up to 90 or you know, two, uh, I think an hour and a half. Or, um, anyway, so we have that time estimate and then when we do our usage stats each month, we times the usage by the time saving and then we have a monthly time saving and then we have a total so we can say from when we started, we've saved X amount of hours. Um, so it is an estimate, but it's, I think if you try to be too accurate, you'd never get anything. Mm -hmm. So, And when we give it to, back to our partners, we say this is the estimated time saving. Um, with the ROI, um, we do calculate an ROI, but we found we try, we're not promoting it as much as we used to because we get into lengthy discussions about how you calculated it and what average billable rate did you use, and it kind of detracts from what you're mm -hmm. trying to prove, and people spend more time discussing how you, your calculation. So at the moment, we're focusing a lot more on usage and time saving um, as showing our efficiency gains. That makes a lot of sense. Um, so thank you so much for that. Um, if, if, if efficiency and accuracy is, is expected benefit of automation, how are you capturing, measuring, and proving that you're achieving that? Um, I think there's always the spot check that you can run on it to make sure things are happening. Um, you can also, sometimes what we may do is speak to the risk team, see what kind of trends you get in terms of complaints or things that you're noticing and see if any of those are in relation to um, errors that have been eradicated or improved upon by using document automation. So uh, one of the documents that we've automated is our letter of engagement, which I call client Claire letter. Um, and because that is a risk approved document um, and it has a, a firm standing point as to what we agree and there's a less less chance of people going off piste um, or using something that doesn't comply with what our compliance team would want them to say. So that is an accuracy there. Um, another way in which we use it to get accuracy um, in terms of data and simple things like details because, you know, Humans make errors, they make mistakes when they're typing, things like that, um, that we try to make sure that databases where we put information from are being taken from source. So we speak to our financial systems where we put information in or we have um, other Excel spreadsheets or various things where we're putting things on or we have our lookup tables and things. So we're making sure that the data is accurate at source and that's what's being pulled in, and that's how we ensure that the accuracy is there. Okay. We're literally about to run out of time, but perhaps we've got time for one more question, um, which I think we've talked about ROI, but I think, so what non-FIONA documents have you automated other than engagement letters? If you could answer that really quickly. Yeah. I don't think so, we'll have time for uh, one yeah, more, unfortunately. It's development team. So it's putting together um, FIONA CVs, yeah. um, where you may have about 40 FIONAs, um, and you're pulling those together to maybe uh, pitch a tender. Um, 
we have now have a very quick way of pulling those together, which before used to take about an hour and now takes um, a few minutes. Okay. I think probably we'd better, better wrap up. But listen, I just wanted to say, and if Chris, if you've got anything to add to no, no. uh, Thank you so much, everybody. It's been a real pleasure chatting to you. And thank you so much to, to, to everyone who um, sent questions in. And I'm sorry that we've run out of time. Uh, we can put, uh, be told we can put questions to the panel after the webinar and send out uh, those answers afterwards. So, um, so your questions weren't sent in in vain. And thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks. Bye bye. Thank you.